Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Alex. Today, you guys, I want to talk about magnetic field therapy. So, I am very curious about magnets. Been thinking about them a lot. I didn't study physics in college, but the curiosity is still there. So this week, I found myself Googling the different things that magnets can do. And turns out, they have components in health and wellness. So today, we're going to talk about magnetic field therapy. So the different types that there are, what it is, how it works, and who should or should not use it. From pain management to insomnia, scientists have studied this pretty extensively. So we're going to do a deep dive into this and see if this is right for you and the specific things that are going on in your personal life. So first up, what even is magnetic field therapy? Well, magnetic field therapy uses a couple of different types of magnets on your body to boost your overall health. They also think that they may be able to use it to treat certain conditions like arthritic pain or insomnia. But there are several different types of it. There's static magnetic field therapy, electrically charged magnetic field therapy, and magnetic therapy with acupuncture. But first, why would someone even put a magnet on their body? That in and of itself sounds pretty weird, right? Well, that's part of the reason I looked this up this week. I've been reading about the magnetic fields that are natural in our bodies. So your body does have natural magnetic and electric fields. And that's down to even your molecules. Even your molecules, every one of them, have a small amount of magnetic energy inside of them. So, because scientifically they have found that you have these tiny magnetic fields in your body, they have hypothesized that you can help with certain problems by putting those magnetic fields back into balance. So, if you are going near a magnetic field of the specified types for therapy, they think that they can perhaps put everything back to normal. So, this works in the way that you have ions in your body, right? Like calcium and potassium. And specific ions like those help your cells to communicate with each other and with your body in general. They send signals to different parts of your brain. And scientists have used magnets to change how these ions act in these different scientific experiments. So there hasn't been a lot of evidence so far that magnets have the same effect on cells when they're in your body. That's a bit harder to test. So why might someone use this? Mostly, it's a treatment option for different types of pain, especially pain in your feet and or your back. So scientists have specifically studied magnets when it comes to wound healing, insomnia, headaches, fibromyalgia pain, and arthritic pain. 
So while your body has these natural electromagnetic fields, you can also produce electromagnetic fields technologically, like with radio waves or even television waves. So these practitioners of magnetic field therapy think that they can influence these interactions between the, your body and the earth and other electromagnetic fields around us, and that these can cause both physical and emotional changes in humans. They also believe that in order to have good health and maintain that, it's important to keep your body's electromagnetic field within balance. So, whenever practitioners use these, they apply magnetic field therapies to the outside of the body. And sometimes they couple that with additional medical interventions. So they may electrically charge these magnets to give an electrical pulse to the area they're trying to treat, or they may also accompany the magnetic pulses or the magnets with acupuncture needles so they can treat energy pathways in your body. There's another type referred to as static, and that means it's not electrically charged. And this type is stationary. So they just settle that magnet or that magnetic field over the area for extended periods of time to give you a continuous treatment. Think kind of like the concept of the birth control patch or a nicotine patch. Now, although we've been talking about magnets, mostly in the modern medical context, they've actually been around and been used for health and wellness therapies for thousands of years. These are not new at all. So the history of magnet therapy is millennia old, but the use of static magnets for health and healing is currently classified as a complementary approach of energy medicine by the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. So as we discussed in previous podcasts, this would be considered to be a CAM. So it's a complementary approach, not an alternative, but it can definitely be considered as a complementary approach. There's a book called The Yellow Emperor's Book of Internal Medicine that was written around 2000 BCE, and it's considered to be the world's earliest medical textbook. This book talks about a whole bunch of different things in health and medicine, but it also describes applying a lodestone to the body's energy channels, or also called their meridians, to treat imbalances in those magnetic fields. A lodestone is Earth's only natural magnet, so they were applying this to their bodies to try to treat these imbalances. And that's something that scientists have been studying in modern medicine. But it's really been around for literally thousands of years. There's also the religious scriptures of the Hindus called Vedas. And it's another old, old piece of literature that includes descriptions of using instruments like a Siktavadi or a Shmana for healing. And they think that both of those devices were made out of lodestone, those natural earth magnets. Also, both the ancient Greeks and Egyptians have provided evidence through their writings. So again, these ancient texts in whatever form they may take, in whatever language they're in, show us that there are healing properties in magnets in their belief system, and that they used magnets to treat a wide range of disorders. How successful that was? I don't know. We'll get to that part later on today. But I thought it was very interesting that people in India and Greece and Egypt, all over the world, people all over the world, have been using these natural magnets for thousands of years for the same purposes. So in addition to that, in the 16th century, 
there was a Swiss physician named Paracelsus, and he proposed that there was a connection between the mind and the body through a life force that he referred to as Arceus. So according to this guy, Paracelsus, this life force or energy, Arceus, was influenced by the forces that are inherent in magnets. And so he thought that because of this, that magnets could be used to treat illness and promote self-healing and address that interconnection between the mind and the body. And that's very interesting to me, especially because scientists have been studying not just physical ailments with magnets, but also emotional ones. So Paracelsus used these magnets to treat a wide range of issues, and that included bleeding, diarrhea, epilepsy, inflammation, and he'd also worked on ways of preparing those lodestones, those magnets, for different client applications and for a variety of conditions. In the 17th century, a man named William Gilbert was the doctor for Queen Elizabeth I, and he continued this trend of using magnets to promote health and treat ailments. And he had a book called De Magnete of the Magnets, and it talked about the differences between static electricity and magnetism and electricity in the 17th century. And Gilbert suggested that the Earth itself is a giant magnet. And inside of this book of magnets, he talked about how there is a direction, or multiple directions, of the Earth's magnetic lines of force, and that they create compass variations. By the middle of the 18th century, carbon steel magnets were available widely throughout Europe, and people really started getting very interested in the healing properties of magnets. So a Hungarian-born Jesuit priest and astronomer, because a lot of times back then, priests were also astronomers, or they were also philosophers. It was a wide range of things. Being a priest could mean a lot of stuff back then. And Maximilian Hell was this Hungarian-born Jesuit priest and astronomer. And he shaped magnets to look like structures of the body that needed treatment. And then he offered magnetism to his clients, and they reported good results. So his ideas and his work also influenced someone named Franz Anton Mesmer. And Mesmer was a physician and a scientist who was trained in mathematics and law and also medicine. He was super well-rounded, a renaissance man, if you will. And like Paracelsus, Mesmer believed that there was a universal life force. But while Paracelsus called it Arceus, Mesmer called it animal magnetism. And he coined that term. And he used it to describe the force in all living creatures. So the energy for him that was concentrated in magnets was defined as mineral magnetism, not animal magnetism. But Mesmer thought that bodily fluids had a polarity to them, and that if these negatively and positively charged poles got misaligned, it could result in illness. And so by applying magnets, you could realign those poles and fix the polarity. Think sci-fi, where they're big fans of reversing the polarity. This is big in science all around. Uh, and not just in health and wellness. So, Mesmer thought that you could use this to treat everything from deafness to seizures, and he would use his own hands, so the animal magnetism coming from his hands, in addition to those magnetic forces, those mineral forces, or mineral magnetism, magnets, his hand and magnets is what he was using, to help cure these people, or to at least treat them. And he believed that you could magnetize water, wood, anything. Think like that infomercial with that crazy glue where they're like, you can glue water to wood, to bricks, to sand, or and just other crazy stuff. So like that. So he was like, you know, you can magnetize anything. 
And with his own animal magnetism and the enhancement of mineral magnets to increase the conduction of that energy, he believed that it could help transfer it from his hands to the client. And Mesmer was really popular with the general public, and he also treated many, many clients. But the medical community in general was really skeptical about his work and his findings, and they were very critical of him. So they portrayed animal and mineral magnetism as being just a sham, and medical authorities advised the public that magnetic healing was due simply to the power of suggestion. So it's that mind over matter, and it was not actually the result of an observable or measurable biological process. So Mesmer's popularity in Europe started fading, and interest in magnet therapy in the United States grew. We're always a little bit behind the curve. So in 1795, a physician from Connecticut named Elisha Perkins got a patent for his magnetic tractor. And it was this magnetic device that could theoretically remove the cause of an illness by drawing out bad energy. And he convinced three medical facilities in the U.S. and surgeons of the Royal Frederick Hospital in Copenhagen that the magnetic tractor had healing properties, and he ended up reporting 5,000 cured cases. But the Connecticut Medical Society determined that those tractors were just a sham. And people who were pushing magnet therapy and the, you know, magnetic products like hats, magnetic belts, insoles, etc. Those continued being made into the early 20th century, but with little support from the established medical community. But after antibiotic therapy started working and we started getting more advances in surgical procedures, magnet therapy became less of just a shadowy kind of complementary medicine that we pushed aside, and people thought of it as being more quackery. However, now that we are in the 21st century, magnet therapy has gained some more traction and started garnering more interest, not just from the general public, but also from scientists. And we now have a brand new wide array of tools to help us study whether anything is actually changing in the body or if it truly is mind over matter. Back then, we couldn't really tell the difference scientifically. It was only internal biased reporting. And, you know, the mind is going to win over that one. You're not able to see if someone is actually healed, only that they believe that they've been healed and therefore they feel better. But the power of belief is also valuable in and of itself. And you can talk to cancer doctors to really see that. And many of them say that one of the biggest factors as to whether a person's cancer treatment is going to be successful is whether or not they believe it's going to be successful and to what degree. We're going to go on a quick break. And when we come back, we are going to talk about the current use of magnets in the United States and how that's regulated by the FDA. Stay tuned. Did you know that more than one in three Americans are living with a chronic health condition? Are you one of them? MyHealthTeam.com has a mission. If you are diagnosed with a chronic disease, such as psoriasis, like we've been talking about right now, it should be easy to find the best people around to help you. MyHealthTeam.com serves 40 different chronic health conditions with over 2 million members and over 10 million conversations. There's a team available for you, whether you are living with multiple sclerosis, lupus, eczema, or psoriasis. We have a team of members to connect with, share stories, tips, ideas, and most importantly, emotional support. It's basically like a own little social media for people who are living just like you. Visit MyHealthTeam.com to find out more and find your team. Are you looking to learn more about the latest trends from the fitness world? Are you confused by all the different trends that are out there? The GSMC Fitness Podcast is the place for you. The GSMC Fitness Podcast is the place to come for people of all skill and interest levels. 
Join us as we explore the latest trends in the fitness world. Does that new exercise really work? Should I try yoga? Whatever your question, chances are good you'll find an answer on the GSMC Fitness Podcast. what it is, and also the history of it up to the 21st century. Now we're going to pick up with where we are in the 21st century regarding magnet therapy, specifically in the U.S. So currently, the U.S. FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, requires that folks who create medical devices or manufacturers of medical devices have to receive marketing clearance from the FDA before the devices can be put on the market for either purchase or just for use. So up to today, the FDA has not cleared static magnets for any type of medical use, and that makes it illegal for magnet manufacturers to advertise that their magnets can be used for medical purposes. But regardless of that, magnets are still sold and marketed widely in drugstores, health food stores, and, you know, on online vendors and via direct mail. So you can still get access to them even if the FDA has not approved them specifically for medical purposes and has not approved people to market them as saying that they can definitely help with these ailments. So you can still get them, but the FDA hasn't approved them. Now, the cost of these can be anywhere from just a few bucks to thousands of dollars. It just depends on the strength of the magnet and the specific type of the product. So this lack of FDA approval hasn't really stopped people from writing books on the use and health benefits of magnets. And more importantly, it hasn't stopped scientists from performing studies on it. So just because the FDA hasn't approved it yet doesn't mean that scientists can't study it. It just means that they haven't found significant statistical evidence so far in these scientific empirical studies that support it enough to go ahead and assert that, yes, these things definitely work. So although a lot of contemporary authors will warn readers that acute or undiagnosed illnesses or pain definitely requires an examination by a doctor and that magnet therapy can't really cure any disease or illness, a lot of them still suggest that you can use static magnets in combination with other types of medicine, so remember complementary medicine, to promote health and healing. So most of these healthcare professionals who are writing these books about using magnets are recommending it as a CAM, but in the complementary sense, not as an alternative to anything. So most authors specifically state that static magnets are an effective method of treatment for treating a wide range of pain conditions that are the result of arthritis, tension, carpal tunnel syndrome, sciatica, post-polio syndrome, traumatic injuries, fibromyalgia, and unknown origins. So these anecdotal reports and endorsements for using magnets for conditions like depression and hypertension can also be found in these works of literature about magnetic therapy. Now, some authors have also reported on scientific literature that supports applying magnets, but they tend to not talk a lot about the research design or the study limitations. And in science, that's very important. That was a really important part of my thesis when I wrote it for my master's degree and making sure that I well documented my research design and that I also did a, my due diligence in looking at my study's limitations. So things that it can say, things that it can't say. And you want to make sure that you are honest about the things that your research cannot say or the things that it could not address because you didn't have access to certain tools or things like that. 
And often the limitations are accompanied by recommendations for future research. So it's not, you know, giving yourself a hard time or anything like that. It's just looking at the body of work objectively and going, okay, this is reasonably what I can say, but this is also what I can't say. Like, this is a correlation, not causation, as we've discussed in previous podcasts. But in the future, if we wanted to look at causation, I would recommend, you know, going at it from these perspectives or using these types of tools or collaborating with these people from another discipline to really see the full effect that is really going on here. Let's get people from an outside perspective to go ahead and take a look at this too, because I'm looking at it from one way, but you know, they also study these things from a different perspective and they might see something that I don't. So that's really what those limitations come down to. And that's why they're really important to disclose and to discuss. But a lot of these papers or these books that are talking about using magnets don't go into the research design or the study limitations. And that should always be a red flag for you. Anyone who is taking a very scientific approach would normally, typically, be glad to share that information with you. And indeed, when you go to write a thesis, you often have to take a research design class. I had to take an entire semester of research design, and that was separate from my statistics class. Then we also had to write out our research design in our thesis proposal and defend that in front of a panel of our professors. And if they thought that there was room for improvement, you had to go back and put that in there before they would go ahead and pass you for it. And that's your thesis proposal defense. So before you even do the project or get that far into it, you have to have your research design approved to go, hey, is this efficacious? Is it going to measure what I think I want to measure? Is this thing that I think I want to measure what I actually need to measure? And so you have guidance to help you figure out how to best look at this. And then you, once you get that approved, get to go through and do the research. And then when you write the body of research, you have your professors read it as you go along. They give you some feedback on it. And then you have to do your thesis defense as well in order to graduate if you have the thesis option. So that's kind of how it works, and it gave me a real appreciation for the scientific method and just the scientific process in general and making sure that we are studying what we think we're studying and that we're not overreaching when it comes to our conclusions. So a lot of these research studies that people are talking about, it's important to take a look at it and see how they designed it. Did it measure what they thought they were measuring? And is it correlation rather than causation? Are they honest about their study limitations? And those are some of the problems that we have in a lot of the literature about magnet therapy. There are also a lot of papers and conference reports that say they support the application and positive outcomes of static magnets but they've not been published in peer-reviewed journals. So that means they were able to go and present their thoughts or their research at a conference, but that they weren't actually submitted to peer review later on. And peer review is important because it means that other people in the field look at this and generally go, okay, yes, that measured what you thought it was going to measure. That's interesting. It's not really something for people to debate, but to rather look at the body of work and go, hey, was the scientific method followed properly? Does this research design make sense? And are they honest about their conclusions? So it's other scientists keeping their fellow scientists, their peers, in check and making sure that everyone is agreeing on these things. And that may seem small, but that's the foundation upon which testifying about forensic science in court is based. It's important that the scientific community in general supports this so that you don't have 
rogue people out here getting paid to just report things for a specific agenda. So when you're looking at sources for this, it's important to see if they are in peer-reviewed journals. And if you want to find that out, you can just type in the name of the journal and peer-reviewed. And it'll usually take you to a page on the journal that explains their peer review process or that they are peer reviewed and they also have an editor who goes over it too. And a lot of my professors in college also did peer reviewing for journals. I've done it myself and it can be really helpful. So you don't want to be mean about it. It's a constructive critique, not just a straight up criticism, but different professors take different approaches. My statistics professor mostly ran the stats for things, or he'd look at it and go, hey, that statistic doesn't tell you what you need to be looking at. It's telling you something different. And yes, it's math, so you put in numbers, you're going to get a result. But that doesn't mean that it's actually meaningful for your specific question you're asking. So the type of statistical test you run is based on the type of information that you're trying to find out. And that was how he taught that class. He was teaching the whys of statistics instead of just the hows. So that was really important and interesting as a class. I really enjoyed it. If you don't like math, you might not enjoy it. But I really liked it. And most of the class was about figuring out when to use different statistical tests, which tests are appropriate for your research questions. And so for him, that is the primary thing that he looked for in these studies. And he would go, hey, you know, this is not quite what you're looking for. Hey, maybe try an ANOVA instead or try a chi-square test. And he's also the person I went to when I went to go and do my thesis. He wasn't even on my committee, but I was racking my brain. I'm like, hey, this is the statistics I think I should do. I can't think of anything else that I'm looking for. Poke holes in this for me. And he couldn't find any holes either. So then I felt better. I'm like, okay, he loves looking for problems in this type of thing. It's one of his hobbies to do these peer reviews. So perfect. If I can pass his peer review, I can pass anybody's. But that's also how I selected people for my committee. I selected them based on different strengths. I selected one for their biomechanics expertise and another for their high attention to detail and phrasing and another for their mathematics experience. Everyone has different strengths. Remember, we're all different and we have these holistic components that make up who we are, but we are individuals and our strengths are unique to us. So I was trying to get a holistic perspective on my thesis by finding those strengths in the people around me and choosing my committee that way. And that worked really well for me. And it's something to look for in the research that you're studying too, whether that be on magnets or on TENS units or neurology, anything really. So now that we have covered the history of magnet therapy from millennia back up to the 21st century, we are going to go on a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the scientific factors in these magnetic field strengths in the 21st century and also the different types of magnetic therapy. Stay tuned. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Before 
before the break, we were talking about the history of magnets in health and wellness therapy from thousands of years ago up until today. So now that we know the history of these, we're going to dig more into the science of it. Why do we think magnets are able to fix these things in health and wellness? How are these things measured? So when people do these scientific studies, they look at the magnet strength. So your static magnet strength is determined by something called your magnetic flux lines and their density. So that's going to tell you their internal strength of the magnet. And that measurement or rating can be different from the surface of that magnet. And that's just going to tell you about the external surface. So you're getting these measurements about the internal abilities of the magnet, the internal magnetism strength, and then the external magnetism strength from that external surface. So think of it as like a surface to volume type of measurement. A lot of times magnet manufacturers report only the internal rating of your magnets, and that tends to be dramatically less than the surface rating. Now, what does that mean when it comes to magnets in your personal life? Well, a typical refrigerator magnet measures less than 10 Gs or 10 Gauss, whereas a therapeutic magnet measures from 200 to 3,000 Gauss, G-A-U-S-S. So Gauss is just the name for the magnetism, the magnetic flux line density inside of these magnets. So that's a pretty big difference. Some scientists have also put these types of magnets into categories. So anything that's less than 10 Gauss or 10 G is what we'll call it, is weak. Anything from 10 to 500 G is medium. So you have a few magnets in there that could be used for therapeutic reasons. Then from 500 to 2000, you have strong. And then anything over 2000 G is very strong. So that lines up with our 200 to 3000 for the therapeutic magnets. And therapists who use magnets for health and wellness also consider the depth of the tissue that you're treating and the surface area of the magnet when they decide what gauss of strength to use. So in addition to the magnet size and its strength, magnetic therapy practitioners also make decisions about how long you should be exposed to these magnets the amount of your body surface that is exposed to the magnetic field too, and whether or not the magnet is unipolar versus bipolar. So some authors suggest that you can get better benefits from a very strong magnet used for a very short time period. Others think that magnets should be worn all the time and removed when pain relief finally does occur. So for some folks, using static magnets intermittently can be better for pain management. For others, using these magnets continuously long-term over days and months helps them more. Different strokes for different folks. So the biggest controversy in magnet therapy is usually regarding polarity. Should it be unipolar? Should it be bipolar? Magnet products can be bought in either form. So the bipolar products are designed so that you have both the north and the south poles facing your body. The unipolar ones are also referred to as unidirectional magnets, and those have only one pole, north or south, that faces the body, and the opposite one faces away from the body. So some people who study magnet therapy and that includes authors and scientists, suggests that having a complete unipolar field isn't really possible because every magnet has a north and south pole. And so a certain amount of opposite pole bleed through, as they term it, will always happen because you just can't do anything about it. There's no way to have a magnet that just has a single pole. 
a property of magnets is that it requires them to be dipolar, really. So, a lot of literature focuses on whether the North Pole or the South Pole, or both, should be used to treat a wide variety of different conditions. So, some research suggests that the North Pole, which is the negative pole, is desired if your goal is to reduce pain and swelling and to help you relax. While the South Pole, also called the Positive Pole, is also thought to promote swelling and tissue acidity and to stimulate wakefulness. But so far, there hasn't really been any statistically significant research that has good research design to support the idea that either pole is more effective than the other. And a lot of therapists who use magnets don't bother with determining whether to use the North Pole or, to, or the South Pole because, honestly, the research doesn't support a difference. And the research does say, hey, you're going to have some bleed through no matter what. So, one author says that if you're using a unipolar magnet and your pain increases, try to use the other side. And it sounds very simplistic. But also, that's the scientific method. You tried a thing, you observed what happened, it was not the outcome that you intended, and so you try something different. In this case, you have two poles on this magnet, and it's a unipolar one, so we're going to flip it over and use the other pole instead. You'll still have some of that bleed through, but perhaps if your pain increases with the one pole, flipping it over will help you decrease the pain. And that's the scientific method, baby. So it sounds really simple, but that's science. Sometimes it's just simple and easy. Now, that doesn't mean that flipping it over will definitely work. It just means, hey, we tried one way. Let's scientific method this thing out. See if we can get it to work a different way. So, you can look to scientific studies for this information, but you can also go to the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine to get more background info on magnets. If you look on that website, the NCCAM website, then you can find a wide range of research reports. And some of them are written by the NCCAM staff, and when that happens, they are often reviewed by scientific experts from both within and outside of the NCCAM. And you can get these things free of charge to go and read yourself. So there's a specific report in there called Questions and Answers About Using Magnets to Treat Pain, and it tells you about the definition, the history, and examples of products using magnets, and things that you should know as a consumer when you're considering magnets to treat your pain. A lot of theories about how the actual mechanism works range from changing cell function to increasing blood flow. And we're really, oddly, even though this has been around for millennia, we're still at the scientific frontiers of testing these things. So we are still finding out different ways that these may work, different ways that we thought they worked, but maybe it's actually the opposite. We're just following the scientific method through in studying these. So these research reports that you can find online also tend to include brief findings from reviews of other scientific studies. Scientific reviews are really great because they look at a wide range of different studies and then kind of look at them and go, hey, what do these have in common with each other? What do these disagree on? Is there any type of general consensus? And it really gives you a, a good overall view without having to read all of the articles individually. There's also a list of magnet studies supported by the NCCAM, and you can also find that in that report called Questions and Answers About Using Magnets to Treat Pain on their website. Magnetic therapy is thought to work in one of two ways. They think that either magnets create an electromagnetic field that induces a mild current and stimulates your nerve endings, or, and, and or, 
that magnets decrease the sensitivity of the pain receptive fibers and increase localized blood flow. Remember, as we discussed in previous episodes, your blood carries oxygen and nutrients to the rest of your body, so it can be really important for healing. And that's not just regular plain old wound healing. Typically, when they talk about wound healing, they're generally speaking about soft tissue. But they've also used electromagnetic therapy to promote bone healing, which is pretty metal. And your vascular system is very important for bone healing. So I could definitely see why they would think that that might be one of the theories of action, particularly since a lot of your body has those magnetic fields in it, all the way down to your tiniest molecules. So overall, magnet therapy is considered to be a form of energy medicine and also complementary medicine in that world of CAM. But a lot of folks can't agree on what is better for someone, whether you should use the North Pole or the South Pole, or whether that differs depending on different illnesses or just specific people. There's a lot of variability in it. And that doesn't mean that it doesn't work at all. It just means we need more research to see what's going on, because either it's going to turn out that it doesn't work, or that there are perhaps some confounding variables in there that we haven't controlled for yet, and that we need to continue exploring until we can identify them and weed those out to see what's truly happening. So as for now, the doctors, the scientists, are using Gauss meters, so those are devices that measure the strength of a magnetic field, and the way that they read as either negative or positive depends on how the measuring probe of the Gauss meter is oriented toward the surface of the magnet. So it doesn't tell you just the actual flat polarity of a particular side of the magnet. As you move that Gauss probe, 180 degrees, the negative reading will become positive and vice versa. So that adds some confusion to it. Polarity can be complex, whether you're using unipolar or bipolar magnets. So clinicians still have a long way to go in finding the best ways to do this. We are going to go on a quick break, and when we come back, we are going to talk about the three major types of magnetic therapy and who should and should not use this so you can gauge whether or not it's something you'd like to try. Stay tuned. Dealing and living with the chronic health conditions such as psoriasis can be a really lonely journey. This is where MyHealthTeam.com had a vision of providing safe, objective, patient-driven social networks. Everything from lupus and multiple sclerosis to Parkinson's, heart disease, and many more. My Health Team is the largest and fastest growing portfolio of social networks serving the nearly one in two adults facing a chronic condition. It's basically a digital space where you can connect peer-to-peer support with over 10 million conversations being held regarding your specific chronic health condition. It contains a growing library of condition guides, articles, and resources, and includes real conversations from real people. You're not alone. Join an online support community at myhealthteam.com. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or any where you find podcasts just type gsmc in the search bar welcome back before the break we were discussing scientific studies 
to magnet therapy. Now we're going to talk about the three main types of magnet therapy and who should try it and who shouldn't try it. Just like anything else, magnets come with a side effect or a perhaps danger depending on individual circumstances. So first up, those three main types we talked about earlier were static magnetic field therapy, electrically charged magnetic therapy, and magnetic therapy combined with acupuncture. So the first two are really the main two. The other one is just it being used in combination with acupuncture. So with static field therapy, static magnetic field therapy, you touch a magnet to your skin somehow. That could be anything from wearing a magnetic bracelet or other types of magnetized jewelry, or it could be essentially a bandage with a magnet in it. So think like that birth control patch or a nicotine patch. And then you can also wear a magnet as a shoe insole. They make them in all kinds of different shapes nowadays. You can also sleep on a special mattress pad that has a magnet inside of it. Now that said, make sure that you're getting the right kind of magnet. You can't just put any old magnet in there. Don't try to go full princess in the pee and get yourself a stack of mattresses and just shove magnets in between it. That's not how it works. Remember, we want to have them with the right gauss levels and everything. So you also have electrically charged magnetic therapy. And those magnets have an electric charge in addition to their magnetic polarity. So treatment with electromagnetic therapy generally comes through an electric pulse. So think kind of like a TENS unit, but also with a magnetic field component. If magnetic therapists are combining magnets with acupuncture, they normally work by putting the magnets on the same sections of skin that your acupuncturist would normally focus on in your acupuncture session. And they often refer to these areas as your energy pathways or channels. So you can use these for a variety of different purposes, as we've discussed, and in different ways. But ultimately, how safe are they? Well, if you have a pacemaker, you should not use them. So remember that pacemakers are electronic devices, and just like you don't want to get heavy-duty magnets near your computer because it can wipe all of that information and tank your devices, and that includes anything that's really digital rather than analog, the same thing can happen with a pacemaker, and that can be very, very dangerous. So while it's generally safe for most people to have that low-intensity static magnet on their body, it's not a good idea if you have a pacemaker or if you have any other type of electronic device that your body relies upon for any type of health and wellness measure. So insulin pumps should also not be used in conjunction with these static magnets, even if they're low intensity. Also, if you're pregnant, you should not be using these magnets. Now, the pregnancy one was very interesting to me. So I totally understand the basis of the insulin pump and the pacemaker. Those make immediate sense to me because I understand how magnets work to mess up computers, mess up electronics. So I'm like, okay, that checks out. That makes a lot of sense. I don't even really feel compelled to look into the background of that one. But for pregnancy, that's something that's very natural. And we live on an earth with an electromagnetic field. And we have these inside of ourselves too. So that felt very interesting to me because there's not necessarily an electronic component to that. So why are pregnant women more susceptible to problems with magnetic fields? Well, it turns out that a study of real-world exposure to non-ionizing radiation from magnetic fields in pregnant women was correlated with a significantly higher rate of miscarriage. 
Now, what this means is that when we're talking about non-ionizing radiation from magnetic fields, that type is produced when electric devices are in use and electricity is flowing. So that can be from a wide range of different environmental sources. That includes electric appliances, power lines, transformers, wireless devices, and wireless networks. And humans are exposed to these magnetic fields based on how close in proximity we are to these sources while they are in use. So the health hazards from ionizing radiation have been well established and studied over the years. And ionizing radiation is different from the type we were talking about, non-ionizing radiation, and that the ionizing kind is the kind that causes radiation sickness and cancer, genetic damage. But so far, we haven't found a lot of problems regarding non-ionizing radiation. So some people went in and studied this. And the doctor who studied this was Dr. Deccan Lee, who has an MD and a PhD, and was the PI of this study, the principal investigator. That means he's in charge. There are probably master's degree students or doctoral students, postdocs that are studying under him and also working on this research, but that he is making sure that everything is making sense with the research design. Kind of like the committee I talked about earlier for my thesis. So this principal investigator, Dr. Lee, is also a reproductive and perinatal epidemiologist. So that's pretty cool. I love epidemiology, studying diseases and how those work. And so Dr. Lee is specifically studying reproductive health and disease and also disease surrounding child carrying and childbirth. So around pregnancy. So right before, right after, he checks on things like, you know, what happens if you don't have enough folic acid? Oh, spina bifida. So you need to have enough folic acid this far ahead of becoming pregnant in order for the baby to have a good development of that neural tube because neural tube defects happen so early on that the folic acid is imperative if you are thinking of becoming pregnant. Now, I learned about that in college because I was taking a class on child growth and development, and that surprised me at the time. I thought that, you know, when you get pregnant, you just start taking the vitamins. I was a young woman. I didn't know. But it turns out that you need it early on. So if you are wanting to become pregnant or you're planning to become pregnant, by taking a multivitamin with the B vitamin folic acid in it, then you can reduce the risk of neural tube defects by up to 70%. And that is according to the American Pregnancy Association. I looked up the specific number for you guys. And that's because folic acid is a water-soluble B vitamin and it helps you to build healthy cells. But you don't keep it in your body for very long, so you have to keep putting it in there. Specifically, you want to start taking that at least one month before pregnancy and for the first three months during pregnancy to help prevent that. And most women don't know they're pregnant until like eight weeks or so in. So by the time most women realize they're pregnant, that really important time for formation of the neural tube has already gone by. So really, your first trimester a lot of that goes by before you realize that you're pregnant. So you want to make sure that you are taking that folic acid a month before you're planning to become pregnant and also for the first three months during pregnancy. Now, you can also keep taking the folic acid regardless of whether or not you're wanting to become pregnant, but it's very important for the growth and development of a fetus. I got off on a little bit of a tangent just there, but I am just very interested in reproductive health in general as well as epidemiology. So I wanted to point that out because that one shocked me a little bit in college and it's something I try to share with my fellow people who may want to become pregnant just to give everybody the best shot possible. So 
now that we've covered what exactly Dr. Lee studies, the specific study we're talking about is non-ionizing radiation. And Dr. Lee wanted to look at this because very few studies have been able to accurately measure exposure to magnetic field non-ionizing radiation. So not the kind that causes cancer, the kind that comes from things like cell phones, etc. So Dr. Lee wanted to address the lack of research on that subject, and he also wanted to explore whether there was a biological threshold beyond which problems may develop. Is there a point that our body can keep up with, and after a certain point, is it really dangerous, or does it matter for us? Does non-ionizing radiation impact us negatively at all? So he wanted to understand the possible mechanisms for any types of increased risk. In a study that the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences funded, researchers asked women over the age of 18 with confirmed pregnancies to wear a small magnetic field monitoring device for 24 hours. So this device is kind of like when you see actors get mic'd up for being on television or something. It's about the size of a deck of cards, really. And so they had this on their body for 24 hours. And then the participants also kept a diary of their activities for that day. And then they were interviewed in person to help control for possible confounding factors. So things like how typical their activities were on the monitoring day versus other days. And to also ask questions about activities that the people who were going through this and were under the monitoring would not necessarily think to include. So if you don't know something has non-ionizing radiation, you might not be likely to include it in your list because you're really listing out everything you did that day, but with especially in mind what seems pertinent to the study. So what you don't know, you can't report. So the researchers also interviewed them to help control for that. In addition to that, they asked questions like, you know, have you had a lot of nausea or vomiting? Do you have a past history of miscarriage? They asked questions about alcohol and caffeine use, as well as maternal fever and infections, because all of those variables have been associated with influencing the risk of miscarriage. So they wanted to control for confounding variables again. They looked at the magnetic field outcomes and were tracking them for 913 women. That's a really solid sample size. Miscarriage occurred in 10.4% of the women who had the lowest measured exposed level of magnetic fields with non-ionizing radiation on a typical day. And they also found that in 24.2% of the women who had the higher measured exposure level. So they put that into what they call quartile, so these groups of four And so the people in that first group of four were in that 10.4% with the really low measured levels. And the second, third, and fourth quartiles were all combined for the higher measured exposure level. And they saw nearly three times higher risk with the folks who were exposed to more of that non-ionizing radiation in a typical day than the others who had a lower amount. So the rate of miscarriage reported in the general population is between 10 and 15 percent. So Dr. Lee concluded that the study was providing evidence from a human population that magnetic field non-ionizing radiation could have adverse biological impacts on human health. So they can't definitively say that that is what cause the miscarriages, but rather that there is a correlation between higher non-ionizing radiation exposure and also the relative risk of miscarriages. And then it was higher in the women who were in the second, third, and fourth quartiles than it was for even the general population risk. Again, there could be other confounding variables in there. I don't want anybody to panic or anything like that. But Dr. Lee noted that this study was important because it used an objective measuring device and looked at a short-term outcome. So in this case, that would be miscarriage. 
instead of one that could occur years or decades later, like cancer or autoimmune diseases, which are often studied with ionizing radiation. So that helps to limit the amount of variables that could be confounding within that time period. The study's main limitation, as Dr. Lee noted, and I appreciated that Dr. Lee included this, was that it's not really feasible for researchers to ask participants to keep that measuring device on them throughout pregnancy because it is so big. It's the size of a deck of cards, and I don't know about y'all, but women's pockets in general are almost non-existent in most of my pants. Almost all of my skirts and dresses have them. I do love dresses with pockets. But in a lot of women's clothing, there aren't really great pockets. And you need that on your body in order to measure that magnetic field. You can't just carry it in a purse. So combine that with a pregnant belly and what pregnancy pants really tend to look like and whether or not they have access to pockets because of the way that the clothes are made, as well as biological constraints. And you can see that it would be really difficult to have a pregnant woman carry that on her all of the time. So that is one of the limitations. They were only able to do this for like a 24-hour period and then had to extrapolate whether or not that was pretty typical for their day and say, okay, if we assume this, then this is how much they're normally exposed to as a baseline throughout their regular day, and we can assume that they are exposed to this much every single day for their pregnancy. They may be exposed to a little bit more or a little bit less. It just depends on how typical this day was for them. Dr. Lee also will be the first to tell you that the potential health risk for these non-ionizing radiation magnetic fields need more research. So that's a big thing with scientists. We are just eager for more information, you guys. So we want to explore all the things. We don't want our research to stop with just us. And Dr. Lee says that they hope that the finding from that study will stimulate these additional studies to be performed, especially as it relates to potential environmental hazards to human health, especially, as in Dr. Lee's case, the health of pregnant women. So they're still exploring specifically why. They're still looking at the causation of it, but they have found correlations. And so that's why they say that people who are pregnant should not do magnetic field therapy. That doesn't mean you got to throw out your fridge magnets. Remember, those are only 10 Gauss, and the ones that are used for magnetic field therapy are between 200 and 3,000 Gauss, or G. They've also found side effects in people who have had magnetic field therapy, and that includes pain, nausea, and dizziness, but also just like a lot of other therapeutic treatments, including medication that is like oral medication, things like that, things that are over the counter, those side effects are rare. So they still have to mention them because they have been reported, but in general, those side effects are rare, and if you aren't using a pacemaker or an insulin pump or anything else like that that might be very susceptible to changes by an electromagnetic field. And if you're not pregnant, then maybe this could be right for you. Now, does it work though? Unfortunately, there haven't been many studies on magnetic field therapy, as Dr. Lee lamented. So the ones that we have seen don't have enough data typically to draw solid conclusions. Now, with Dr. Lee's data, that's why it was so important, and I wanted to mention it, because it had a sample size of 913 pregnant individuals. That's an awesome sample size. So that is going to be really helpful for driving more of these studies in the future. And as we get more technologically advanced, we may find better ways to study these things. A lot of folks are against complementary and alternative medicine because we have trouble studying it scientifically. And so a lot of folks relegate it to the realm of quackery. However, sci-fi author Arthur C. Clarke said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. 
Now, I normally apply that to sci-fi as I watch shows like Stargate, and you see characters like the Nox or, you know, gold technology where all the Jaffa think that it's magic or that they're gods because they don't understand that it's technology and how to control it. But I also think that that really applies to a lot of stuff going on here on Earth. Now, as a scientist, I also think that that doesn't mean that all of these things that people try necessarily work. A lot of these magnet studies have found that there was no significant difference between how well magnet therapy worked and the placebo that was given to people in that study. So a lot of it might just be all in the mind. But then again, maybe we just don't understand it entirely yet. And as we're able to measure these things in different ways, we may progress more in the future, like we did from a couple thousand years ago when people first started writing about magnet therapy, all the way up through today, where we can have people carry around magnetic field detection devices to see what their day is like and what type of magnetic fields they're exposed to on the daily. We didn't always have radiation level detectors. We didn't always have magnetic field detectors. But now we do. And as science advances, I'm really excited to see what they discover about magnetic therapy. Whether it works or whether it doesn't. As a scientist, I am stoked to find out. So the TLDR of this one is that so far we don't really know how well it works or any specifics for it. We just see data right now that show associations between wellness when it comes to women who are pregnant and miscarriage regarding their exposure to non-ionizing radiation those magnetic fields that are associated with non-ionizing radiation, the non-cancer-causing type. So we don't know yet if there were other factors involved with that, but if you're not pregnant and you don't have one of those devices inside your body, like a pacemaker or an insulin pump, and you're not trying to become pregnant, then talk to your doctor about whether or not this might be a good cam for you. You might enjoy this complementary medicine, Maybe you'll be one of the folks that it works for. And after all, even if it is mind over matter, does it really matter if it's matter or if it's the mind that's controlling it? I don't know. I don't have that answer for you. And you and your medical practitioner should make that decision together as partners in your personal health and wellness journey. Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC Health and Wellness Podcast. Brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I like to ask that you please subscribe to the show, and writing a nice review always really helps us. Also, if you could please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, I'd appreciate it. Thank you kindly, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Health and Wellness Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program living with a medical condition can be hard my health team gives you the support you need meet others living with a medical condition and gain insights on managing treatment today at myhealthteam.com.